Julie Wilson, we are live back again with the Ahab Breakdown. How are you? At long last. I feel like we've had some pre-recorded episodes going on in January, so we haven't seen you guys live since December, which just feels like a while, but welcome to 2022. We are back. Yeah, and I'm really excited about this episode um, more generally because I'm just excited to be live again, but really because we've got some great guests today and someone I know pretty well, so I, I love talking to Jacob. I'm really excited about it. Jules, what do we have on tap today? Yeah, so as you guys all know, this is a live episode, but it will be recorded and available on YouTube um, so everyone else can watch it if they couldn't make it today. Follow us on social media as usual, Ahab Talent across YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Clubhouse, etc. cetera. Um, and as always, if you guys have studio selfies, tag Ahab Talent and we will reshare. We really want to get your guys' work out there too. So this week, we are going to be talking about crafting narrative podcasts. Um, make sure that everyone, as always, is asking questions in the question, the Q&A box. Uh, and upvote the questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. Uh, the hour goes quickly. Um, and then, of course, our favorite part of the day is our VO roulette um, part of the show. We are always bringing someone on just to kind of find out who you are, what you're working on, and see if you have any questions for our guests as well. So if you're interested in being featured on VO roulette, type it in the private chat to the panelists. Uh, if you're picked, Molly will bring you up on stage. There's nothing you need to do. Um, and she will uh, invite you on and tell you to turn on your sound and camera and uh, we'll get to know you a little better. So let Molly know. Yeah. Um, so first off, as usual, we're going to kick off with, um, you know, some content corner content we ship. Um, and this month I've been listening to tons of stuff to get us through the winter, but I've been listening to a lot of Adam Grant, who I really respect. Um, and I just listened to the Audible original of Power Moves. Um, in which Adam traveled to the World Economic Forum and interviewed CEOs from all over the world about the concept of power. And I think a lot of the lessons can be provide to provide insight on your professional lives, but also on your personal lives. And um, I really like that it was a free flowing conversation. So a new version of an audiobook in a certain way, and uh, you get to hear from a ton of different, very interesting, um, accomplished individuals. So highly recommend Power Moves by Adam Grant. Uh, what about you, Dan? So I'm gonna talk about the book that is right now, I think the hottest book inside the building at Penguin Random House. And I was hearing all this buzz and I was like, I gotta just listen to this because everybody's talking about it. It's called The Maid by Nita Prose. Uh, it's read by Lauren Ambrose. It is uh, kind of a thriller. And Lauren Ambrose, if you don't know her, she was on the show Six Feet Under. She's really well known for that, but she's a really talented actor. Um, and this is a first person narrative from the point of view of a maid who kind of gets herself caught up in a murder and, you know, with some really interesting people. And Lauren Ambrose, you know, not only is Nita Prose like just such a skilled writer, like, I like I'm slightly worried about who Nita Pros is because she like basically becomes this maid in this first person narrative. But Lauren Ambrose slowly but surely like just draws you into this story. And she, you know, she becomes this maid. And for the entire nine hours, I couldn't stop listening. I listened to it over the weekend. And I found myself like going to the supermarket and sitting in the parking lot for 30 minutes trying to get through a chapter because I did not want to stop listening. So check it out. Lauren Ambrose, really, really skilled reader um, and an excellent, excellent book by Nita Prose. Check out The Maid. So who else do we have to present a sample this week? Um, <laughs> now, I told Julie, I'm like, I have to introduce this person. He's an old friend. He is, uh, when I got to Penguin Random House uh, or Random House as it was, Years ago, he was one of the first producers I worked with. We spent a lot of time over lunches and drinks and traveling to Grammy celebrations and talking about entertainment and movies and books and films. Uh, and he is one of the best producers I've ever been around um, and has done so many other things over the years, which I'm gonna tell you, uh, Jacob Bronstein. Uh, Jacob spent 10 plus years at Random House in audiobook production, book publishing and digital content uh, product development where he first produced and directed audiobook projects with authors and actors, including Tom Hanks, Judy Bloom, Michael Chabon, 
as well as three Grammy Award winning programs with Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. Uh, things that we have in common. We both have uh, Grammys from the Obamas and the Clintons. Uh, Jacob produced the first Star Wars podcast with Lucasfilm, then went on to lead a digital marketing team and create products in the app and ebook space, as well as serving a digital as a digital consultant to publishers, editors, authors, advising on acquisitions and audience growth. Jacob spent eight plus years at Apple, launching and leading marketing organizations for Apple Books, iBooks, Apple News, and Apple Podcasts. As a marketer, digital strategist, and audio producer, Jacob has collaborated with brands including Lemonada, Media, Insider, Gimlet, Findaway, Spotify, and Apple, including developing the project for Apple's first original audiobook production. So welcome to the show, my friend, my colleague, Jacob Bronstein. Turn on your camera, sir. It feels like a super introduction and like a, a big <laughs> entry. Turn on. <laughs> we don't have the fireworks. There's supposed to be fireworks behind this. <laughs> it starts. For some reason, it's not working today. So welcome, welcome, Jake. Can you just uh, tell us what you have for us today on Sample Review? I found a sample of an actor who I think some of you were more familiar with than I was. I haven't worked with this actor, but her name is Andia Winslow, and I'd love to work with her. She's a consummate professional. She's incredibly accomplished voiceover across animation, commercials, audiobooks. Um, I'm probably forgetting some medium. She's got a larger career on camera and other places that I won't get into, but she's an incredible actor. Um, and I loved listening to a lot of the samples she has available on Ahab, but focusing on this particular one, um, it's from a nonfiction essay by a wonderful author named Renee Watson, who we could spend a lot of time talking about, but Andia does an incredible job with material. I think she's um, one of these actors who you immediately hear a personality you hear a 360 degree person. Um, and I sort of I, I articulate that as distinct from, there are those that you find disappear into a character and sometimes maybe that's called for with material. But I think what attracted me to this sample and what I think I'm attracted to often is hearing a point of view and a, a, a person behind the read. Um, so uh, that's how I would I'd set it off. I feel like it, it should really mostly speak for itself. Um, are we going to listen to it now? We yeah. are. Molly, can you Molly bring it up? Molly, pull it up. Remember This by Renee Watson. And when the weight of being a Black girl feels like a burden and not a blessing, remember this. Black girl, you are a miracle. Know that you can survive what feels impossible to survive because someone somewhere prayed for you, is praying for you. Because someone somewhere already survived, is surviving. Remember Lucille Clifton and Maya Angelou. Remember Fannie Lou Hamer and Shirley Chisholm. They will teach you how to love the kink of your hair, the width of your hips, the brown of your skin. They will teach you how to heal and be whole, how to find beauty in brokenness. They will teach you how to carry revolution in your bones. Remember, you have never been alone. You have always had a map, always had your ancestors showing you the way. Wow. You know, Jake, it's funny that you selected Andia because I have looked at her profile and actually listened to her samples so many times and said, I've got to find something for her. Yeah. Um, but it's, that is a beautiful, beautiful recording. Jules, what did you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I fortunately, unfortunately haven't come across her yet, but I, I completely understand what you're saying about her giving the text a point of view. And also She's a beautiful sound and she sounds so present, which is always what I'm looking for. I, I, authenticity is one of my favorite words and, and that's what you hear with her. So great, great pick. All right, Jules, do you wanna bring on our second guest? 
Yeah, of course. I'm very excited to introduce Ruth Lichtman, who um, has recently started directing for us. So I'm excited to get to know Ruth a lot better and understand the content she's worked on before coming for, for to PRH Audio. So Ruth is a multidisciplinary artist, producer, and director whose video work has been featured in the New York Times, the Atlantic, and the Huffington Post. She assistant directed Animated Life, an Emmy non nominated science puppet video series. And since 2017, she's been working in the audio world. She worked with Two Up, first on the musical podcast, 36 Questions, and subsequently produced and directed episodes of the second season of their narrative fiction podcast, Limetown. She's worked as a producer for Crooked Media on the 15 episode documentary podcast, The Wilderness, and got to meet President Obama, I guess the man of the episode, during an interview for their final episode. And like I mentioned, she's been an audiobook director for Penguin Random House since March of 2021. So Ruth, come on and join us. Hello. Hello. More fireworks going on. Yeah, that's what I'm imagining right now. <laughs> <laughs> so well, thanks for joining us, Ruth. Uh, thank you. So why don't we kick it off with just simply, you know, what was your journey uh, to working on narrative podcasts? How did you get into this space? Um, yeah, I, I started in this world in sort of a, a weird roundabout way. Um, I had toured with a band that wrote a musical and through them, I met this incredible community right when I moved to New York of um, theater folks making interactive theater. And through that, I met a composer and she, Ellen Winter, is one of the composers of 36 Questions. So it's through her that I came into working with Two Up and then dove into this audio world. And simultaneously, I've been making films and animations and casting narrators and working with voice talent in that way, uh, especially in science media to try to bring their voices through. Uh, and so these two things happened in tandem over the last I guess, seven years. Cool. How about you, Jacob? Tell us a little bit about your background. You know, I've always been an audio guy from when I was a kid. First, that was mostly through music. And then that got me into recording technology. And then working in recording studios, I found the world of audiobooks. Many years ago, I began to work with colleagues of yours at Random House Audio and ended up finding that whole career, but simultaneously, you know, stayed with music. And then the early days of podcasts before they were even, you know, there was no podcast app, there was no apps. Uh, you know, you had to sync your iPod and all that, but I always listened. Um, and then because I was a lover of the content would make this stuff on the side and be able to somehow, you know, wove that into my professional life. So I actually, I think Dan mentioned, I tried producing podcasts for the first time when I worked as an audiobook producer on the Star Wars audiobooks. And we did a kind of nonfiction behind the scenes about this was, uh, I think, the coming of like episode two or three. And so this was a big deal for Star Wars fans at the time, but mostly learned you know, how tough it is to make a great podcast at the time. Made a lot of mistakes, which I guess everyone does at the beginning, um, but certainly learned a lot. I was not a journalist. I didn't have that background, which is so common in podcasts. But um, I think it was just through loving podcasts, you know, you try to somehow bring that into your work life here and there. I've often been on the, the business side and development and acquisitions, but always maintained this creative production strain over here and um so i, I guess when i i had long-term roles at big companies for most of my career a couple years ago i left as the cliche goes you know spend more time with family and to spend more time on what i wanted to do and um spent much more time in the podcast world than the audiobook world at first and got to help some podcast network start and got to staff some teams and got to kind of choose for myself whether I wanted to work on certain shows more hands-on. And so I knew a lot that I brought to those 
projects, but also you're always learning. And I think in the past couple of years, continued to kind of uh, refine my chops across casting. I've been doing a lot of story editing. Um, sorry for the long-winded answer, but it's just not a direct pathway. No. Yeah, I mean, we always say that even in audiobooks, like most people, until maybe recently, right, Jake? Like nobody really wanted to be in audiobooks. You just kind of found yourself there. Yeah. And then it just kind of like became evergreen and you, be, you know, you That's kind true. of moved into other aspects of audio. But like yeah. years ago, people were like, audiobooks? Like, why do I want to be in, like, for the why blind? Why do you make books for the blind? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, uh, speaking of podcasts and audiobooks, you know, I think a lot of our viewers are now very familiar with the whole production process as it pertains to audiobooks, but I'm sure when it comes to podcasts, it's a little bit different. So can you guys go into a little bit about what the production process is from start to finish with podcasts? Yeah, this one's a big one to chew on. I mean, yeah. it's it, it really varies production to production. Um, and I think probably one of the ways in which Jacob and my work contrasts that I've been working in these tiny teams like two up was a two person company when I joined them, the largest our team got was probably 10 people. Um, so those production processes are tiny and involves everyone wearing a lot of hats. Um, including like daily meetings with writers scripts changing on the fly, you know, like all of these things felt um, really like densely mixed together throughout the process, both for 36 questions, which was the musical podcast um, and Limetown season two, as well as our collaboration with Crooked Media for the wilderness. So to bite off the production process, I mean, I, I guess like we should specify what kind of show we're even, we wanna dive into. Um, it's an important point, because I think I always talk about how we use this one word podcasts, even though I guess we're saying narrative podcasts, to really apply to a lot of very different kinds of shows and therefore a lot of different production processes. If it's that kind of episodic chat show, I guess that's not narrative, but couldn't be farther away from the production process for like Limetown. That's probably closer to, you know, producing theater in, in most ways. Mm -hmm. And then if you get into nonfiction and there's the idea of, you know, reporting and obviously writing, but, um, you know, that's its own world. Um, I don't know if it's interesting maybe to break that down to where you bring in voice talent for each of those different production yeah. processes. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure people would be very curious about where, where that entry point might be for them. Um, yeah, I'll start by talking about 36 questions since that was sort of the beginning of my podcast journey. Um, like I said, the way I got introduced to that production in general was through this group of New York theater artists. A lot of them had just graduated from Sarah Lawrence grad school and had gone into the like downtown theater scene of New York, which, you know, smaller off-Broadway productions. And, um, it was through that that a lot of the musical talent and voice talent was first cast. We did sort of a demo round before we even did the production itself, which is really rare to have that opportunity, but like it, it just hadn't been done before. And so they had to figure out how do you make it work? Like, how do you translate a musical to a podcast format? So that was our initial stage. And once we had sort of worked out the kinks of how to integrate you know, like what feels sort of filmic um, theater, theatery style dialogue with these songs, we moved on to the next process where we opened the casting process, the casting calls in general. And this was before the age of uh, folks being on Zoom or getting great quality audio remotely. And so it was a New York centered process. Um, everybody was from here more or less. And so there were some folks who were sourced from the theater scene, but we also had Broadway musicians. There were people who, you know, had like once met the directors and composers of this musical and flew in for a week or two to be in the process. So it was generally based here, um, but a lot of it was through these smaller networks that and relationships that people had built um, in previous live work. 
it always feels like, you know, with podcasts that there's this kind of all hands on deck mentality. Um, the more that I talk to people who are in podcasts and Jake, you kind of touched on it a little bit, right? This idea that like some, you know, you're doing, you're dabbling in script work and, you know, I know you have a, like an extensive audio background. So when I do talk to podcasters, either like really small teams who are just like, yeah, I'm writing the script and I'm doing the editing and post and myself and, you know, I got a guy who's got a great mic and we're doing that, or it's these much larger teams, you know, have you had experience, Jacob, in working with like larger teams of, of podcasters who are, are building that? And how is that usually, you know, how does that work and, and where are they looking for talent usually? So, you know, maybe as a good point of contrast, um, and it's a good product plug at the same time, a show I produced last year, the first time I used Ahab um, to cast anything, it was for a narrative podcast. Um, and that was, you know, uh, um, it was for a company called Diversion Podcasts. And so this is uh, an established network and they actually come out of book publishing, but still a fairly small production team. Um, but this was a nonfiction narrative show. It was largely based on a book that had been published. The name of the show is Good Assassins. And um so i worked with an author i functioned as producer and kind of story editor i did casting as well on this show and we were um producing a show it's about a spy mission from the 1960s a true story with a lot of true characters we had a lot of uh original source material some of which we had tape for we had recordings of these people talking we loved using that but at the same time, we had a lot of material that we didn't have tape for, and that's where I went to Ahab and had to cast something like 10 different actors. Some had a lot of material. A few folks I was grabbing, um, you know, they were had a few lines only. But it became, um, I think, more parallel to how you might cast an audiobook in that there was text, it was set, I needed actors with great ability who could do long form, who could do short form. Um, I was looking in that particular show for a lot of people with very particular accents. I needed very particular Eastern European accents and this ethnic background from this country at this time. Um, Ahab was great because I was able to specify those kinds of abilities and um, you know, essentially set up an online casting call for someone who could do, you know, 1960s East German, but with some Jewish Israeli blah, 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 who could speak Hebrew, but needed to be able to narrate in English and all these particularities, um, but went through that casting process. So I was sort of lead in casting, but had a team that was listening with me and approving. I had this author who was this great expert. Um, and obviously I had my team at Diversion Podcasts where there was a, a subjective round of, I just love that actor. He's very capable. She's not, he is, et cetera. Um, so that's, I won't go into the whole production process, but it was, um, it was a great, Ahab was great to be able to use for that particular process. Yeah, I think Jules and I could probably compare that to like some of the stuff we did with Seth Rogen's thing, where it was like, well, Seth's going to wrap this whole thing with his narrative, but like, every chapter there are going to be all these sequences that are basically mini kind of dramatizations of his real life yeah. um and it was really helpful to kind of just like post auditions and be able to listen through all of those things yeah um yeah so, are are there perhaps. are there other resources or platforms or anything that you guys use other than ahab to cast for these types of narrative podcasts or, or where do you go to find your talent? Are you, are you guys headed out to like talking to agents like, you know, in like we are in the audiobook community and really seeking out actors that way too? Yeah, definitely. Uh, sure. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I think just uh, um, Skip and Zach, who are the co-heads of Two Up, like they're represented by William Morris. And so they went through WME to approach a lot of folks. And that was sort of a first round consideration, like who would be your dream, you know, person for this role. And then trying to see if there was anybody who we might have an inroad in through WME. And that was definitely a piece of the process for Limetown. Jake, I mean, 
given your extensive background in, in audiobooks, you know, do you think the audiobook kind of narration generally translates well to podcast work? I mean, I know it varies by podcast, et cetera. Are there any skills that you think are non-transferable or that maybe audiobook narrators don't really bring to the table or need to bring to the table in the podcast space? I mean, I know it varies based on the podcast, but. Yeah, I, I guess probably pretty hard to generalize, but maybe so often we look for in the great audiobook narrator, narrator someone who's, you know, able to embody everything, but, you know, is, is essentially they're, they're reading a text and they've got to be one voice to bring you through most likely several hours. And it's a generally a different kind of level of variation um, than someone who's going to come in as one element in the context of several elements. It's that talent feels more, I think, closer to maybe voiceover talents of some kind, acting in the traditional sense, film acting, theater acting. Um, I can already hear in the back of my head a lot of actors saying, oh, that's wrong, because you know these things share so much. Um, it's hard to articulate truly the differences, but I guess often that kind of level of theater, level of variation maybe is higher in, in a lot of the podcast voice acting that I'm casting for. Yeah. And I know we're in, we're still in the COVID times, but are you, are either of you kind of like looking at recording things with multiple actors in a room at the same time? I mean, I know we've done that a lot virtually in the last year where, you know, five actors are in a room kind of playing off of each other and everyone's recording their stuff live in that space and then sending us audio. Are you all kind of dabbling in that too now? I'm not doing a lot of multi-voice stuff. If it's multi-voice, I'm most often recording people separately and combining in posts. That just happens to be the stuff I've been working on lately. Yeah, I was gonna say the, the same. Um, I think it's been like, I really miss the energy of having a lot of folks in a room. I think you get such a unique performance and I feel like I've been really lucky to be in studios where, you know, they can create eye co like eye line through the glass. You get this incredible energy and yeah, maybe it's partially like just my love of live performance, but I definitely feel it in the recording. So I, d I miss that a lot, but no, I haven't been doing anything like that recently. Ugh, maybe someday as yeah. the world opens up a bit. I think, I think the process is a little more mechanical now that we're not able to do that. Right. Like actors have to, you know, when you're not looking at someone in the eye or you're not um, in that physical space, there is just like certain reactions that, you know, you might not get. And maybe you have to read it five different ways in order to right. get. Um, when we recorded um, Angels in America with the, the cast from a few years back, you know, the cast had left New York and they went all over the world and we're recording them in, in different spaces all over the world. Yeah. And it was just fascinating to say, okay, we're going to do like six takes of each line and I want you to read it exactly the way they read it. Mm. And fascinating, like strangely enough, those actors were able to do that because they'd been on stage for so long together that they knew exactly how Nathan Lane said that line in the play. So they knew how they had to react. Mm. But I think when you're, you know, maybe producing audio content, you don't have that kind of like years worth of practice before you get in there. So mm -hmm. kind of, you know, I guess having a director in, in the room kind of working through that is probably really important, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm the first to say, I always, I think a director is always important in all these yeah. processes. You know, I would never try to take away from an actor's ability, but like you wouldn't have an author publish a book without working with an editor. And I always feel that that outside perspective objective, I don't know if guidance sounds wrong, but um, I think it's so important. And yeah, in person's obviously always the best for this. I never directed over the phone almost 100% until COVID, yeah. but now it feels very normal and you know, it's been working pretty well. 
Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, uh, we finally adjusted to it, but I still think people would rather be sitting across. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because I do think even in directing something, there's a physicality to that sometimes when you have sight, like how many times that we talk about like sight lines in a studio and being able to see yes. talent, right? Yeah. Um, but I do know a lot of actors who don't want the camera on when they're home. Like they don't want to see you. I don't want to, yeah, yeah I just want to hear yeah. you. Yeah. Let me know. Right. <laughs> Um, so for our audience, which is made up of a lot of voiceover actors and audiobook narrators, do you guys have any recommendations for them for how they could possibly dovetail their careers into nar narrative podcasts? Are there any skill sets that they should develop or samples they should create or people mm -hmm. they should connect with about getting work or, or tell us a bit about that? You know, the first thing I always say, and I hope this doesn't sound obvious, but I think it's important is become really familiar with the medium. You're always going to be a better voiceover actor for narrative podcasts if you know some great narrative podcasts. And I think that often does get overlooked. Um, and again, like repeating a bit of what I said before, understanding how different podcasts can be and that, you know, the uh, planet money sounds very different from right. cereal sounds different from smartless almost to be really three different medium um but these kind of uh, limited series podcasts which are most often non-fiction but more and more is the rise of fiction um getting to know those and hearing all the great talent that's on some of those shows that are out there yeah I think this like goes back actually, Dan, to the question you were asking before about, you know, so what are the sort of stylistic differences between um, audiobook narration and narrative podcast or fiction narration? And I would say like the best I can offer is I remember many times when we were listening to people's sides and tapes, like hearing something that sounded like a beautiful audiobook, but didn't feel like acting, didn't feel present and didn't have that sort of intimacy that we were really looking to capture that like is the greatest gift of I think narrative fiction is that it is so intimate, it's in your earphones. And so trying to, you know, like this, I think Jacob said it, listen, hear what people are doing, hear what you can kind of do in this medium that you don't necessarily have permission for in in audiobook land, you know, it's just a little bit different how you can put your voice out there. Yeah, and we kind of say it all the time, like applying, like don't apply things you do for other mediums in their entirety to the like pod, like don't go from commercial work and like try to do podcast work and think that this, they're the same thing. As Jacob said, like know your medium, listen, 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 and, and really understand what they're asking you for. Don't go in saying, well, this is what my voice does. And you're going to use the instrument. We're going to use the instrument this way every time. Right. And I would and just add, like, oh, go ahead. Well, you were, I think you started to say it before, but it's wonderful to hear, you know, for instance, on Ahab, different samples from different medium. So rarely, though, do you see actors including podcast samples. And I hope I'm not off, but that's been my experience. There's great audiobook samples, great commercial voiceover, animation. But it would always be wonderful to hear that, you know, narrative podcast demo. And for, for somebody, for instance, we always tell audiobook narrators, if you've never recorded an audiobook before, just pull a book off the shelf. What would you recommend in ter terms of what type of text to use for those types of samples? Mm. It's a little tricky. Yeah. It is a little tricky. I think it goes back to finding something out there that you like and using that as a demo. Have you guys um, started to see with like, obviously, like every time you turn around, there's a new podcast. Jake, I know you know this, there's thousands of them at this point. I know you've created a bunch of them yourself. Have you guys seen that these budgets for podcasts are growing mm. to some extent? You know, I think in every industry, as they grow, you're kind of like, oh, well, actors expect that the budgets are going to grow. Therefore, you know, they're going to be paid more. But I mean, I'm sure it varies depending on where it's going, you know, like who's producing it and who has the money behind it. But have you all seen more money being put into the talent for podcasts in the last year or two? 
it's 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 okay to say no. It's okay to say no. All these examples in the news, you know, we're seeing so much buzz around podcasts and giant numbers with big acquisitions of shows of networks. And so I think there's a perception, boy, there's just money flooding into the podcast industry. And while there are those examples of, you know, Joe Rogan getting eight billion dollars, um, and yes, I know that's a gross exaggeration. Um, Generally, I would say that I think budgets are probably going down. Podcasts, ad supported audio, if we're thinking of traditional podcasts, if you get into the new world of subscriptions, that's possibly another story. But generally, podcasts are very hard to monetize. And there are 5 million podcasts out there. It's a tiny percentage that really earn back. And as increasingly, all sorts of organizations, news organizations begin to release audio, release podcasts. They're trying to find their business, meaning their, their profit. And it's, it's a very tough medium. So while there are lots of exceptions, I generally feel like they're trying to find ways of producing audio cheaper and cheaper. Yeah, I think it's, I, I mean, I think Jacob can speak with more authority to the grander scale of budgets, but like um, just even being on the New York Public Radio listserv, which if there are any, you know, whatever folks at home who haven't heard of that, it's an incredible resource for audio in general and also has a lot of casting opportunities. Um, highly recommend joining. Anyone can join. It's awesome. Um, but yeah, you see people ask often for what they should propose for budgets and the very, <laughs> it's humbling to see what most people are making to do this work, which is very labor intensive, but I think it's absolutely right to say that folks are often underpaid in the audio world. Oh. And I, I just, yeah. It can, I think even in narrative, like narrative audio, the big budgets are really rare because the returns on those are also rare. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, you can look at the list of top 10 podcasts this year and last year, and there's always some mainstays that are always on that list, right? You know, This American Life and things like that, that are always kind of at the top of the list. And breaking through is like any other form of media, right? Like a lot of these projects probably start out as passion projects where it's like groups of people saying collectively, like, let's create this. And if they break through, great. And then there's like that other group, which is like, oh, these are this is like marketing content for us, but we're going to position it as a podcast. And there's really no way of like distinguishing between those things out in the market and, and discovery, you know, just discovering this content, I think is the hardest part, right? I mean, it, everyone can go out and create a podcast. How many times have you said, oh, that guy has a podcast. I didn't know that because it's so hard to break through. Um, so, and then when you finally break through, you know, maybe there's some money there, but I, I'm sure just like anything, independent films or um, anything books. in the in the media industry, books, I mean, books is the perfect example of, you know, investments. You know, I think someone had said about the publishing industry, you know, sometimes it's, it's like we're starting a thousand startups every year. And right. if you get one gone girl, like you're making, you're making bank on that, right? Um, but it's really hard to break through. Um, and usually it's the artists who end up, you know, having to sacrifice their time uh, and their passion for it. Uh, yeah. And on the note of branding and marketing, Jacob, I'm looking at you because I know you've done a lot of that. So can you talk a little bit about branding and marketing a narrative podcast and, and what goes into that? Uh, oh, wow. Um, you know, I think that there's this big change in marketing podcasts happening over the last couple of years as the medium sort of matures and becomes much more mainstream. Um, I think for many years, the only way to market a podcast that was really effective and you really saw a lot of return was marketing on other podcasts. Mm. Meaning you know you've got a podcast listener because you're advertising on a podcast. And to some degree, you know, that's still true, meaning it's still the most effective channel. 
but more and more you see podcasts being advertised in more conventional channels. You see an ad for it on a website. You see the organizations that have marketing budgets, you know, the New York Times is of the world and other folks that can afford paid media campaigns, you know, placing ads out there in the world a little bit more. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but I think that more and more it's becoming more traditional and more comparable to say marketing a book possibly mm -hmm. or, you know, other kind of entertainment media. And you're seeing, you know, a lot more ads on social media channels and where we all advertise everything. Mm -hmm. But it would make sense that the easiest place to go is where the listeners already are. So developing mm -hmm. relationships with these other very popular podcasts. I mean, I've seen that in not narrative podcasts, but in more interview style podcasts where someone's like, I'm going to interview this person. And then as an exchange, oh, I'm so going to appear great. on their podcast. Yeah. And that's probably the, the best thing when it's not really an advertisement, but you're, you know, kind of exchanging, you're placing your guest or your host, you know, in a context where they're being interviewed and it's that much more natural type of promotion. Yeah. 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 We, I mean, we got in a ton of questions before the episode for you guys and just some nitty gritty stuff that I'm sure people would be curious about. Um, we had some questions, um, one from Miguel Perez about, you know, the, the actual physical length of episodes in a season. I'm sure that varies, but do you guys have any insights into how long is an episode typically? How long is a season typically? How many episodes does that involve? I'm sure it varies, but yeah. Yeah. Um I guess I'll, I'll speak to what felt like an outlier at the time. Um, when we did, when we were working with Crooked Media, making The Wilderness, it was a 15 episode season and it was meant to be comprehensive. And we started off and we were like episodes 30 to 45 minutes, ended up being over an hour every single time, which is in, unheard of. Like, I, I feel like that is quite long for a listener, especially with that many episodes. Um, it gave them an opportunity definitely to advertise more, like you can do more than one ad break. So there is a way to sort of make that work. But it, I think generally that felt like a lot. And the scope of that project really felt like making, you know, the same way you would think about movie making, we were sourcing archival, we were interviewing, I think we ended up interviewing 75 people, not all of the transcripts, like not in all of the audio made it in, but it all formed the VO that John voiced, our host. And that was an exhaustive process. So I think a lot of the, the length of these kind of projects is predetermined by how soon you have to get it out there, what kind of timeline you're under, and how you sort of want these episodes to feel. So we were really mimicking um, a film or a TV series, long form series. And that was what we ended up having. And just to, to jump onto that, are, are you typically recording all of that in one, you know, big chunk or is it, you know, are you recording an episode and then next month recording an episode and then so on and so forth? I mean, I'm sure it's varies, but like if you have it all kind of like drawn up i guess from a budget perspective i'm like backing into budgets right like it would make more sense to do it all at one time but I, I, oh my I god it, you're asking a great question and that has to be the most complicated production schedule i've ever worked in my yeah. entire life um i think we had sort of produced the first three episodes in that series as a block because they came out together. And from there, it was um, sort of a bi-weekly soft finishing process. So it was like, we had a rough edit, but then it had to go to legal. We had a fact checker involved. We had a composer working with us to through score every episode and mix and master. And John was recording his VO in chunks like every two episodes or so. And we had him not in the Crooked Media Studios, which has great audio equipment, but we actually had him in a voiceover studio because we wanted it to sound distinct from their weekly, you know, like what their what the typical Crooked show sounded like. So that process, I think our production timeline, we ended up just over a year in part because to get Obama for the last episode took a lot of time. <laughs> I think we ended up getting that interview um to like clinch that last bit 
probably three weeks before that episode came out. It was tight. And then, you know, Jake, I'll ask you this uh, question. Do you, are you seeing any trends generally in just like the types of podcasts that are now kind of really at the forefront of people's minds? I mean, I know everyone's listening to all types of different things, but as we know, just like with books, right? You know, Harry Potter comes out and then there's a hundred books that claim to be the next Harry Potter. Um, are you seeing like a lot of kind of copycat content in, in the podcast space right now? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all aware we're still pretty deeply in a very true crime concentrated. Yeah. Um, I think what's interesting, though, is you're starting to see a lot more flavors of true crime. And it's not all this kind of, you know, bodies and ditches. But there's some really quality true crime out there that I think is trying to be quite authoritative and, and mission based and has some really you know deep reporting. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I guess both in narrative and other types of podcasts, you know, celebrities always kind of drive everything. And we're certainly seeing that grow as, again, the medium's maturing and, and you know, A-list celebs are willing to be on podcasts more and more. You see really incredible talent either starting their own show or showing up as voice talent, um, you know, in, in fiction kinds of productions. Yeah, there's a great uh, true crime though. There's a great uh, documentary series right now about um, the Comedy Store in LA and its history. Um, mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about that show is toward the end of it, uh, the last episode is they keep showing comedians come on stage and in the right hand corner, like photos of their podcast, the kind of like logo, and like all the comedians who have now become podcasters in addition to being comedians and how it supported their brand and everything else. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, it's true crime. And then every comedian or anyone <laughs> who thinks they're funny yeah. has a podcast too at this point. Comedy was definitely one of the early genres and comedians went to the medium early. And, um, you know, we could have a whole show just about comedy podcasts. Yeah, for sure. Um, Ruth, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, but um, it looks like the listserv you mentioned, the NYPR listserv, might require an invitation to access. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, um, so this is, it's a great question. <laughs> uh, you can be added. It's very simple. There's no, like, you don't have to prove your merit, but you do have to know someone who's already a member to be added or have someone who's a member forward you an email. This happens a lot, even though technically it's you're not supposed to you can respond all and say hey can somebody add me to the listserv mm -hmm. honestly like i just get yourself in there if you can i think it's really valuable and paints a really cool picture of what's going on in the audio world right now good super secret insider info yeah, it's, it's, yeah um i guess before we move on to our next segment i you know you talked a lot about listening to a lot of narrative podcasts are there any ones other than your own that you would recommend that uh, actors listen to? Uh, it's my favorite question because I love this stuff so much, particularly for voice actors. I need to think for a moment. I can just off the top of my head, the things I'm listening to right now, I don't have, know that they have a lot of voice over talent. They're more traditional kind of reporting and um, interviewing. Um, I'm listening to a great show from WBUR called Last Scene. And it's uh, the second season. The first season was incredible. And I thought the show had, it was on hiatus for more two, three years. Um, the new season is about various heists. Each episode is the mm -hmm. narrative around a given heist. Um, it's a great show, Last Scene. Yeah, that's totally up my alley. I have to check that out. <laughs> As soon as you said heist, I was just looking at Dan. Yeah, love, <laughs> I love me some heists. Listen to the first, the first season is amazing. That's all around one single heist, and it's one of the, uh, one of the great limited series, in my opinion. Excellent. How about you, Ruth? Man, you know, I should have prepared this one. I feel like this is always where my mind goes blank, but I'm going to be really honest. In the last couple of months, I've been taking a little bit of a podcast hiatus and going deep into the audiobook world and trying to do nonfiction audiobooks, which is like very different than what I typically read. So I have to say, 
I'm a little bit on the outs of what's what's happening right now. So if anybody has suggestions, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll note them down. <laughs> are there any audiobooks you're excited about? We, we, we are audiobook lovers. Oh, yes. Well, that makes sense. Um, I actually just directed a bunch of Shirley Jackson stuff. And so I've been listening to the letters of Shirley Jackson and Kirsten Potter's the narrator. And I was lucky enough to work with her on some of the short stories and on a novel. And it, it, she's brilliant. Shirley Jackson, highly recommend. She's not just like, a, not just the uh, haunting of Hill House or the lottery. She has a lot in her wheelhouse. So the letters have been I love listening to them. It's been really cool. Yeah. And then one last time on this listserv, it looks like people are asking for the name one more time. What is that listserv called? Yes, New York Public Radio Listserv. And I think Molly just put it in the chat. Excellent. Thank and, you. Yeah. Well, let's, you know, chat's gone by very quickly. Let's move on to voiceover roulette and bring on Andrew Perella, who we can ask a few questions to, and I'm sure I'll have a few questions for you guys. So Molly, can you bring Andrew up? It's coming. <laughs> Hello. There he is. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. How are you, How are you doing? doing? I'm well, thanks. I'm well. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks Andrew, for being tell, here. Andrew, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? And uh, maybe your your interest in podcasts or audiobooks, or tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my interests are a little bit in both. I started out working for public radio, uh, and so I worked in um, uh, at WGBH in Boston for about four or five years, and at New Hampshire Public Radio for about 12 Um as a uh, production manager. And I realized uh, about six years ago, I had uh, skills that were in demand. So I started a little side hustle where I was helping other folks start their own podcasts, um, uh, mostly chat casts. Um, and then about two years ago, I decided to make my side hustle my full-time hustle. And so I've been doing podcasts for a bunch of different clients uh, over the years. And then about about the same time, I started trying to dip my toe and get involved a little bit more with audiobooks, and so I've been kind of plugging away, uh, and at, in in that area for for a little while as well. Cool. Great. Do you have Are, any any questions for our for our guests? Um, no, I mean, I think I think like a lot of a lot of the podcasts I work on are are kind of nonfiction podcasts, and I'm, uh, and um, I've 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 listened to a bunch of a bunch of the fiction stuff, and it's just like. What are, what are some of the where are some of the what are some of the resources I guess that you use to mm -hmm. to kind of find the, to find those new talents out you know a, um, Ahab talent obviously is one that uh, that I think you had mentioned Jacob but what were some what were some of the others that that you used to to find talents you know we we also mentioned that certainly the voiceover all the agencies have voiceover teams and there mm -hmm. are even some voiceover agents that really focus on it they're you know wonderful because you can really like you can with a platform like ahab you know go to them with a very specific description of a role and they can come back with several ideas their avenues to all sorts of talent that you know i'm not going to be familiar with on my own so i often start there mm -hmm. uh, after ahab of course sure. sure yeah i think uh jules has a really great story about when we were to bring up the Rogan thing again, because it is massive. But like when we were producing Seth Rogan's audiobook, there was a need for how many kids, Jules? So Maybe. many kids. Like so many to find kids. And so it's many. not something that we host on the platform. And yeah. you reached out to an agent and what, what did we end up with? Yeah, we ended up, I mean, I ended up talking to probably three different agencies. And I mean, I love the casting process so much because I love thinking about how voices are complementary to each other. I think that's the coolest part of it. Um, so yeah, I don't remember how many kids we ended up with. I feel like 13 or something, but they played multiple roles and you were trying to think about who, who is young Seth Rogen? Like, what would he sound like as a tiny kid? Would he have a tiny little, like slightly raspy voice? Like I thought so. And, um, casting before, others. before all the weed consumption, his, <laughs> his, Made it worse. Uh, his voice was gravelly still. But yeah. Like, yeah, we were casting like, you know, Seth Rogen at age nine, Seth Rogen at age 16. And, you know, it's one of those things where he has such a distinguished, like, 
like a voice that's so known throughout the industry that you're like, you're never going to find a kid who sounds like this. And you sent, you called the agency and the agency had like, here's five kids who sound just like <laughs> Seth Rogen. And we yeah. were like, wow, this is weird. Yeah. And so. that, that's always the benefit of agents. Cause they're like this next level of filter who know their clients so well and can really target people that will be right for every single role. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So Andrew, uh, have you worked in the audiobook field at all? Or are you just kind of dabbling at this point? Um, largely dabbling. I've, I've, I've landed a couple of, uh, a couple of audio book jobs over the, over the last year, uh, a few on ACX, a few with, um, uh, with, with some more established pu uh, publishers. Um, but yeah, but just been kind of chipping away and trying to, uh, trying to work my way in. I was hoping the APA was going to be live again, uh, I this know. year, but sadly, uh, APAC, oh. APAC is, uh, is, is remote again, but, uh, but yeah, just kind of chipping away and, and, uh, and trying to, trying to find a toehold. Well, yeah. definitely keep auditioning, show up to those meet and greets, even though they're virtual. And I yeah, also so wish they were in, part, in person, <laughs> but any of those, uh, what, what used to be called speed dating, I'm not sure, Dan, what, what they're called these days, but they are helpful to, to get your face in front of people for sure. And the last thing I'll ask you, um, yeah. so you're dabbling in audiobooks. If there's a book that you could read or a genre you could really dive into, what would that be? Um, I would say like sci-fi and kind of like speculative fiction, um, mm -hmm. is a genre that, um, is a genre that I, I, I can't seem to get enough of, um, you know, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll just have to say LeVar Burton's, Laura Burton reads is one, is one of my favorite, one of my favorite podcasts and, and the stories, the stories that he pulls every week, he and his staff pull every week are just, are just fantastic. And, and, uh, and. I just love getting lost in the worlds that that uh, the writer and and Lavar himself creates every week. So that's that's definitely one of my picks. Yeah, Lavar falls into that category of anything he reads. Yeah, or listen to. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. He could be sentencing me to thirty years in prison. I'd be like, oh man, that sounds great. <laughs> I'm so good. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's so great to meet you, Andrew. We hope you land that next big gig and Thank we'll you. definitely keep an eye out for you on Ahab. So talk soon, Thanks. I hope. Thanks very much for having me. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, it's that time we like to go around and just get some final thoughts. Let's start with uh, with you, Ruth. Any final thoughts for the for the community? Oh man, I just, I feel really pumped up about audio. I think the the pandemic has been such a horribly isolating time. And I've been just incredibly pumped up about the audio community and um, the ways people have found of making audio content that's really quality and still built upon sort of the best aspects of this community of talent um, in the meantime. So just feeling, feeling excited, hopeful. How about you, Jacob? I love what you said, Ruth. Um, maybe I would just say, you know, I loved trying, and I know this is so hard, carving out time to make stuff outside of maybe your conventional work life, but I love audio. I love making audio and different things with music and voiceover, whether you call it a podcast or whatever, but when I have been able to eke out little bits of time like that and make things, it just gives me so much joy and so i would encourage everyone to try and do it i know it's easier said than done but it's the best you know just because no one's hiring you doesn't mean you can't go make something you like yeah and, and before i jules i get to you i'm just going to jump on what jacob said because he he actually kind of said along the same lines of what i was going to say which is like you know, I know when you're an actor, it kind of just feels like, wow, like, how do I break in here? How do I find someone who's doing this? And yeah, you could do all the hard work and dig up, like, who produced this podcast? Where are they getting actors, et cetera? But like, sometimes it's just about making something yourself, like just create and good things will happen. You'll learn a lot from that process. You'll learn what not to do from that process. So, you know, try to carve out time to create as well. Because, you know, acting is an art, you are an artist, and you can create something. It doesn't have to come from 
a writer sitting in a dark room. You could be that writer in the dark room too. Jules, what about you? Yeah, um, I guess before I get to the episode advice, you something you just said just made me think of something for actors that I've never recommended before. But I would say as you're listening to audio content, whether it's podcasts or audiobooks, stick around and listen to the credits and hear who worked mm -hmm. on it. And write that down because for instance if you're trying to do outreach you're trying to develop relationships with us if you see me at a conference or any of these guys and go over to them and said i listened to this project you did and it was really amazing for x y and z reasons that's one of the easiest ways to connect with us because obviously we're very passionate about what we do and i know a lot of writers do that when they're trying to search for their agent they're reading the, those authors notes at the end and seeing who they're thanking and you can do that similarly with audio content too. So just keep that in your back pocket. And then Ruth, what you said about community, community in this industry means the world to me. It's why we do events like this. Um, I think it's just so inspiring to hear from you guys about what you're working on, because I think as all of us have seen, um, the audio industry continues to evolve. And that's what keeps us here because we're not doing what we did five or 10 or 15 years ago. We're working on things that are new and novel and that's why it's creatively satisfying so just keep yourself open too how about you dan why don't you close us out that, that was that was my advice so oh, I, I stole I'm, it I'm, I'm good just keep creating <laughs> um i want to thank both of our guests ruth thank you um you know i know we work on audiobooks with you but it was really good to see you in person and jake as always Thank you again for uh, for coming on the show. Good to see you as well. And uh, you know, we'll be looking out for all of the content you all produce. Um, I'm sure in the Ahab community. So thanks for coming on and sharing your experiences. Yes. And next month we are going to be pre-recorded again, so it will not be a live event, but we will be back in April with a live event. So on March 10th. I'm really excited about this event. We've been working on this for about six months. We're having an advice for LGBTQ actors. It's gonna feature some really big audio greats. Ron Butler, Daniel Henning, Emily Lawrence, Vikas Adam, Danny Martinek, Sean Dasani, and Emily Wu Zeller. So we're gonna give them the mic. Dan and I are gonna step back and let them take the stage. So get excited, get pumped. We're gonna have ever more content for you guys. So thank you everyone for coming too. Thanks, All right. everyone. See, See you next month. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Bye.